You've tuned in to Larger Than Life with Pastor Ron Hint of Calvary Chapel, Houston. Here's a preview from Pastor Ron of today's message. There are times we go, well, I don't know. I don't know about that. Maybe you can be saved now, but maybe later on you're going to lose that thing, buddy. It's going to slip out and it's gone. Not if I'm a true believer. Now we'll talk about the proof of being a true believer, but listen, if you're a true believer, you don't have salvation one day, one week, one year, and you lose it the next. That doesn't happen. Jesus says you have eternal life. It's a possessive. He doesn't take it away. He doesn't choose me to lose me. Faith in Jesus Christ is eternal life now. Have you ever watched a football game where a player fumbles the ball and scrambles to recover it? Well, there are some people who think you can fumble your salvation just like that football. But the good news is that's not the case. Pastor Ron teaches today that for the true believer, salvation isn't something you can just lose. Instead, you've been branded with the seal of Christ. You are marked as his child, and nothing you or anyone else can do will be able to remove that seal from you. You're his forever. Well, let's join Pastor Ron in the book of John chapter 6 as he continues his message, The Bread of Life. This is the same conversation, same declarative truth that he spoke to Nicodemus, Nick at night, in John chapter 3, right? For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believes in him won't perish but have everlasting life. By the way, to kind of continue that conversation before on that sovereign side of God where he calls us to salvation, he chooses us before the salvation of the world, here we have the human side, right? We must believe in Jesus. Though God calls a person, we must exercise our free will. Think of it this way, and this is, this is a, a true case in our nation's history. 1829, George Wilson of Pennsylvania was sentenced to be hung by the United States of America and by the courts for robbing the Postal Service and committing murder. However, President Andrew Jackson had pardoned him. However, as the story unfolded, George Wilson refused the pardon and said that it wasn't a pardon unless he accepted it. Now, this raised a point in law that had never been covered before in our nation's history. So the president called actually the Supreme Court to actually rule on this case. Chief Justice John Marshall gave the following decision. Quote, a pardon is a paper, the value of which depends upon its acceptance by the person implicated. It is hardly to be supposed that one under the sentence of death would refuse to accept it, but if refused, it is legally no pardon. End quote. Subsequently, George Wilson was hanged. So think about this. We are under the penalty of sin, And God offers us a pardon. And he's drawing all of us to come to him and say, I'll forgive your sins, I'll pardon you through faith in Jesus Christ. But I've got to believe. I've got to accept it, or it is no pardon. There is both the sovereign side and there is the responsibility, the human side in regard to salvation. And Jesus says, if you believe, you can have everlasting life. In Matthew 11, 28, he said, come to me. It's the same thing, come to me. All, that's anyone who are laboring and heavy laden, I'll give you rest. So listen, ladies and gentlemen, this is so important. When we talk about the work of God and we talk about the sovereignty of God, understand this, Jesus' work on the cross is unlimited atonement. In other words, there is no limit. Jesus died on the cross for everyone. In 2 Timothy 2, 4, he desires all men to be saved. 2 Peter 3, 9, he doesn't want any to perish, but all come to repentance. So again, if you're here today and you're not a Christian, the Father's drawing you. He's drawing you. And all you have to do is surrender to that. He'll give you new life. That's a powerful principle. However, we now move from the principle to the great proclamation. We've already seen it. Jesus says it many times in this passage. Here it is again in verse 41. I am am the bread of life. Remember in the book of John, Jesus uses that statement seven times, I am. And it's a statement of deity. I'm the bread of life. Your fathers ate manna in the wilderness, and uh, they're dead. 
Now, he talked about this, and we went into detail. I don't want to do that, but he gave the analogy because the people said, well, Moses gave us manna. What are you going to do, Jesus? And he goes, hold on. You want to talk about that? Listen, those people, they ate manna in the wilderness. Yeah, God provided it for 40 years, but they're dead. I've got bread that you can have that's eternal. You'll live forever. This bread, which comes down from heaven, speaking of himself, verse 50, that one may eat of it and not die. Jesus said in John 10, I've come that you might have life. And so again, those who ate the man in the wilderness eventually died. I'm the bread from heaven. I can give you eternal life. By the way, we think of the contrast, and we talked about it a little bit, but the manna in the wilderness, for God to provide it, costs nothing. Oh, but the bread of heaven, it cost the Father, his Son, to provide it. The manna the man in the wilderness was given to a rebellious nation as a gracious gift. The manna from God, Jesus Christ, is manna for, uh, it's bread for a, a rebellious world who can have eternal life through Jesus. So Jesus makes this grand proclamation to the religious leaders. And I'm sure they're stunned at this point, right? By the way, notice the word he uses in verse 50, he who eats of this bread. In other words, just as food must be eaten and digested for nourishment, so we need to partake of Christ. We need to take him into our life for eternal nourishment. Why? He says at the end of verse 50 that one who eats of it doesn't die. Now, the Bible gives us two definitions for death. There is physical death, and there is spiritual death. Physical death we know all about, right? Physical death is when the consciousness of our body ceases to function. Our brain doesn't function. We are physically, clinically dead. But there is another death, spiritual death, and that's separation from God. And we could be alive. A person could be alive right now. But if they don't have a relationship with God, they're spiritually dead. That's why Jesus said you have to be born again. But the person who dies without Christ is, is spiritually dead, separated from God. And that's what Jesus is talking about here. He's saying if you partake of me, you'll be alive. You'll be alive spiritually, born again, and you'll have eternal life with me. He says in verse 51, I am the living bread. I'm the living bread that came down from heaven. Now, this phrase could be translated as it is in some modern translations. I'm the bread that gives life. Again, he's just playing off the fact that I'm the bread of life. I'm the living bread. I give eternal life. And by the way, that statement is the fifth time Jesus has used it in just chapter 6. He really wants to penetrate the hearts of the people. I'm the living bread. I came down from heaven. He adds, if anyone eats of this bread, he'll live forever. And the bread that I give is my flesh, which I give for the life of the world. Now, when Jesus uses this term flesh, what is he saying? Well, he's talking about his body. Best translation, I give my body. Jesus is talking about the fact that he's going to go to the cross. Listen, the cross is less than a year away at this point in the Gospel of John. Passover, the second Passover is just underway. So the next Passover, Jesus will die on the cross for the sins of the world. Jesus is looking towards the cross. Notice he says, and the bread that I shall give. The giving of his flesh or of his body speaks of his death on the cross for our sins. So it is both voluntary, I give, and it is vicarious. It's for all. It's for the world. Eternal life, partaking of me, digesting of me. Powerful proclamation. Well, that leads, that statement leads to a perplexity within the crowd. Look at verse 52. The Jews therefore quarreled amongst themselves. They're arguing. What's he talking about? What's he saying? How can this man give us his flesh to eat? Now, again, these men aren't saved. They're not born again. They can only perceive things with physical eyes in a natural realm. So they missed the whole truth altogether. Not only that, they didn't have an intention of following Jesus. And when you have no intention to follow God, it is closed. Your minds are, you are blinded. So they had no intention to follow Jesus. They really don't want to know, and so they're blinded. Jesus is obviously using an analogy. They turn it. As if Jesus is teaching some kind of twisted cannibalism. What does he mean? How are we all going to eat his flesh? 
Now, did they really think that that's what Jesus was saying? Okay, everybody's got to get a piece of my body. Everybody around the world, just take parts of me. I mean, that's ridiculous, obvious. If you were, were a sincere seeker, you would obviously know what Jesus was saying. But verse 53, most assuredly, so listen up, guys. You don't understand that? I have something more to say. Most assuredly, I say to you, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in it. So Jesus doesn't tone down his statement. He puts it up a notch. He really likes to aggravate these guys. No, I mean, Jesus really is, wants to shake them up. And again, he, he adds the drinking of his blood. Again, he's not speaking literally. He's speaking figuratively and spiritually. And listen, if these guys had stopped for a moment to even think of what he's saying, they understood this. Because these men lived their life studying the law, the Torah. In Leviticus chapter 17 and verse 11 says, the life is in the blood. They were well acquainted with the fact that there must be sacrifice for the forgiveness of sin. That's what they did. Jesus is saying to these men, listen, my body is to be given and my blood will be poured out. That's what he was saying. He was making reference to the cross. He was also saying you need to partake of it. You need to eat the flesh. You need to drink the blood. What is he saying? Well, keep in mind that it, when you say that, it means making it part of your life. Again, just as you take food and drink in and you assimilate it, so eating and drinking is analogous to digesting it. He's saying you want real life? You want eternal life? I need to be part of you. I need to be at the center of your life, guys. And I already told you, if you're looking at me, you're looking at the Father. If you look to the Father, you'll accept me. And by the way, keep in mind also, as a backdrop, in verse 4, and this was said only one day earlier, we are told that the Passover was at hand. So right now, in Capernaum, it's a very busy area and packed with Jews. They're all securing their Passover lamb that they're going to take just, you know, a few miles away to Jerusalem to offer up as a part of the law. And by the way, what did the Passover celebrate? You remember? It meant deliverance from slavery. And of course, Jesus came to deliver us from sin. But what did they do in the Passover? They'd take that little lamb and they would slice its throat. They would let the blood pour into the basin. It got real messy and they would take that blood and they would dab it on the doorpost of the home and on the lintel of their house. Why? So that when God sent that final plague, the angel of death would pass over. Death won't come to that house. Salvation comes to that house. Deliverance comes to that house. Redemption comes to that house. And what Jesus is saying, if you give your heart to me, I'm pouring out my body, my life, so that redemption comes to your life, salvation comes to your life, new life, new beginning. It's a powerful message for them. An incredible proclamation, yet they were perplexed by it. Well, that leads us to the final promises of Jesus to this group of people in verses 54 through 59. Jesus again says, whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life. Notice he doesn't say you might have it. You might hope to get it. No. When you ask me into your life, you assimilate me into your life, you have eternal life. And I, again, I just want to bring out the words from the, the real language here because it makes us it makes it that much more powerful. That word has is a present possessive. So just by understanding, those of you who understand gra grammar, it's a present possessive. You get that. In other words, the very moment a sinner asks Jesus Christ to be their Savior, at that very moment, present possessive, you are saved. He is yours, and you are his. It's the word justified. We use that in our court system, the judicial system. We talk about the justice system. We talked about justification. What is that? I'll tell you what it is. The moment you give your life to Jesus Christ, when I did that, God looked at me justified, never sinned. And that's pretty radical because no one else looks at me that way. I guarantee you my family don't look at me that way. They live with me. Oh, justify, what? Really? I don't know. Oh, we live with that guy. But Jesus sees me. And I'm forgiven. That's, that's a powerful truth. Whoever eats my flesh, drinks my blood, has right now present, possessive, all sins, past, present, and future forgiven. Wow, what powerful security for the believer. Because listen, there are times we go, well, I don't know. I don't know about that. Maybe you can be saved now, but maybe later on you're going to lose that thing, buddy. It's going to slip out and it's gone. Not if I'm a true believer. 
Now, we'll talk about the proof of being a true believer. But listen, if you're a true believer, you don't have salvation one day, one week, one year, and you lose it the next. That doesn't happen. Jesus says you have eternal life. It's a possessive. He doesn't take it away. He doesn't choose me to lose me. Faith in Jesus Christ is eternal life now, or as Jesus called it in John 10.10, it is the abundant life. But I realize that the enemy tries to mess with us, maybe even others try to mess with us. I remember when I was a young Christian, I used to think, well, wait a second, I, I gave my life to Jesus, but then I'd fall into sin, I'm going, maybe I'm not a Christian, you know? And, and that's a good thing to ask yourself, because maybe you're not. But I knew I was, and I was wrestling with this until I came to Romans chapter 8 and verse 1. It says, there is now, therefore, no condemnation to those who are born according to Jesus Christ. Not born of the flesh, but born of the Spirit. No condemnation. I was like, born again, Lord. And, and so I know myself, I condemn myself. Others even condemn me, but I know Jesus doesn't. I'm forgiven. I have eternal life. And so that speaks of a now, and it speaks of eternal, because he says here in verse 54, I might, no, I could, no, I will. That one who truly surrenders to me, I will raise him up that last day. And by the way, that's the fourth time he's made that statement in this chapter. Glorious promise. He continues, for my flesh is food indeed, and my blood is drink indeed. It's the real deal. Now, that's what he's saying. However, I do want to address something here. The Roman Catholic Church uses this passage right here as a proof to say that the elements in the Lord's Supper actually become the actual literal body of Jesus and the actual blood of Jesus. It's what we call the doctrine of transubstantiation. It's not a biblical doctrine. I want you to know that. First of all, this passage has nothing to do with the Lord's Supper. That won't be implemented for another year from now. Beyond that, as we've already talked about, this language is not literal here. It is figurative. Even the Jews would use that language. For example, one of my favorite verses, Jeremiah 15, 16. Your word was found, and I did eat it, and it was the joy and rejoicing of my heart. Now, the prophet Jeremiah wasn't saying, man, that's a good piece of Leviticus. Mm -hmm. I'm going to have some exodus now. I mean, he's not talking about that, right? He's talking figuratively. We do that in our own language. We say, hey, why don't you chew on that for a while, right? Or he really devoured that book. We're not talking about physically eating it. It's, it's figurative. And so you never want to take something that is figurative and make it literal and then make a doctrine out of it. That's very dangerous. Jesus is simply saying, this is the real deal. My body will go to the cross. My blood will be poured out. And through faith in me, you will have everlasting life. Verse 56, he who eats my flesh, and this is another promise, and drinks my blood, here, this is amazing, abides in me, and I in him. That's, for me, that's like, pow, mind-blowing, incredible. I give my life to Jesus, I become part of him, he becomes part of me. There's this incredible unity. In fact, Jesus says this in John 14, 20, at that day, People know that I'm in the Father, you are in me, and I am in you. Oh, wow. That's, that's incredible. And, and listen to this. The word eat and drinks, right? He who eats of me and drinks of me. These are present tense, which speaks to the fact that it's continual. As you are continuing in me, because that's the way this works, I'm continually abiding in you through faith in Jesus Christ. I'm continuing to abide in you, and you will continue to abide in me. And that lets us know who the true believers are because sometimes you go, well, how do we know if there's real security? How do we know if that person's a Christian? I know who Christians are. You want to know who Christians are? Jesus will tell us when we get to John chapter 15 because he says his last I am statement. I am the vine. And he who abides in me and I in him bears much fruit. So guess what? I'm in Christ. He's in me. It's a continual thing. And because it's a continual thing, I'm not falling out. And because it's genuine, guess what? There's fruit in my life that people can see. You don't have to guess about it. I mean, think about this. If you just had a tube, maybe it was a tube of toothpaste, but the outside label got erased off, and you go, well, what's in here? You want to know what's in there? Squeeze it. What's in there comes out. You're a true Christian. When you get squeezed, that's what comes out. If you're not a Christian, you get squeezed, that's what comes out, right? You want to know if you're a genuine believer? What happens when you get squeezed? Now, we're not talking about perfection, but we will know. There's going to be fruit that comes out of our life. Jesus in, Jesus going to come in, going to come out. 
or garbage in, garbage out, right? Pretty clear. I don't see no one clapping about that one. It's like, oh man, you're stepping on my feet, brother. But that's the truth. All right, Jesus continues, as the living Father has sent me, verse 51, and I live because of the Father, so he who feeds on me will live forever. You'll have ever lasting life. Imagine, he's saying this to the religious leaders. He's laid it out so clear. And so he says, this is the bread. Verse 58, I think at this point, for me, I see Jesus saying, this is the bread. I see him pointing to himself. This is the bread. I, I'm new life, which came down from heaven, not as your fathers ate the manna and they're dead. He says it again. But he who eats this bread, partake of me, you will live forever. And again, he notes these things he said in the synagogue as he taught in Capernaum to this religious group of men. So again, in closing, Jesus declares himself the bread of life. And he has saved so many since then. Thousands, millions, millions have given their life to Jesus. Hundreds upon hundreds have given their life to Jesus in these four walls. He's done it for others. He'll do it for you. Are you willing to surrender to him? Let me wind up with what one poet wrote. He said, if I gained the whole world but lost the Savior, would my life be worth living a day? Could my yearning heart find rest and comfort in the things that will soon pass away? Listen, everything in this life is going to pass away. I, I, I've been to a lot of funerals. I've oversaw a lot of funerals. I've never seen anybody take stuff with them, not once. Not once. Not once. He adds, if I gained the whole world but lost the Savior, would my gain be worth the lifelong strife? Lord, life is difficult. Were all the earthly pleasures worth comparing for a moment with the true Savior? And the answer is no. Here's the way Jesus put it. He said, what does it profit a man if he gained everything the world has to offer, but he lost his own soul? Would it be worth it? No, it would not. So listen, I want to give you that opportunity that I accepted many years ago in my life, and I've, I've never looked back and said, man, that was a bad decision. No, it's the best decision I ever made. Listen, I've met people that have gone their whole life, and this is what I've heard said many times. I wish I would have asked Jesus in my life sooner. I've never heard anybody say, wow, I wish I wouldn't have done that. Never. So listen, why put it off? Why wait? Salvation's as easy as ABC. A, admit you're a sinner. The Bible says we all sin, come short of the glory of God. We all sin. And so the Bible says repent that you might be converted, that God can change your heart. That word repent means turn around, make an about face, make a 180, stop living the way you are, recognize you're wrong, you're in sin, you need to turn to God. So that's A, admit that. And then B, believe. Jesus said it many times in this passage. The Bible says it this way in Romans chapter 10 and verse 9. If you confess with your mouth, if you're willing to do that this morning, and believe in your heart God raised from the dead, in other words, he is God, you can be saved. So the final letter is C. What stops you from making a commitment today? What stops you? Pride, embarrassment, I don't know, maybe lies from others. I don't know, Ron, I'm, I, I got to wait until I get my life more cleaned up together. When I get it more cleaned up, I'll come. No, no, come. We sing a song, it's, it's called Come As You Are. Don't, don't worry to get your life fixed up. You'll never get it fixed up enough. Trust me, it's a wreck. So is mine. Until I came to Jesus, and he's the one that does all the work. You just surrender it all to him. Come as you are. Go, God, I'm bringing my mess. Can you fix it? He goes, yeah, I specialize in that. So make a commitment to him. Jesus said, if you want to come after me, let him take up his cross, deny himself, and just follow me. I want to give you an opportunity to follow Jesus today. So would you pray with me? Lord, we thank you for this time in your word again to see that you are the bread of life. You are the one who gives spiritual nourishment and eternal satisfaction. And you said we just need to believe. We need to ask you into our life. And we don't need to put it off any longer. So I know, Lord, that you are faithful. You're knocking on hearts right now. Right now, you're knocking on hearts as we've been going through this passage. You know, and as our eyes are closed, our heads are bowed, that's you. I just want you to know God loves you so much. You've just heard Pastor Ron Hint and the radio ministry of Calvary Houston here on Large Than Life. Pastor Ron's currently in the Gospel of John. John is one of the four books in the Bible that describes the life, ministry, and teachings of Jesus Christ. 
In his short time here on earth, Jesus changed the world and the entire course of human history through his life, death, and resurrection. Whether you joined us halfway through our program today or you caught just the ending, we'd encourage you to visit the link that provides this message in its entirety and other messages like this one. All you have to do is visit ltlradio.org and click on the teaching archive. Do you feel like you're constantly on the go with no time to slow down? You're not alone. And the good news is we've got you covered. You can listen to more of Pastor Ron's message by downloading our mobile app, which is available on our website, ltlradio.org. Were you aware that Larger Than Life is also in podcast form? All you have to do is subscribe. So don't leave that website without doing that. Are you in the Friendswood, Texas area? Do you have a church you call home? If not, we'd like to invite you to join our community as we worship Jesus together. Service times and directions can be found on our website, ltlradio.org. That's all the time we have for today, but we hope you join us again to hear more great teachings right here on Larger Than Life.